So um, what we're talking about today is the science of the skin. Um, so let's start off with a little bit of anatomy, the real boring stuff that we'll get out of the way quickly. But obviously this is really important as to the science and how our whole system works. So just to talk about the skin in general, starting from the bottom, uh, you have the subcutaneous fat. And then the dermis is two layers. The reticular dermis, the lower layer, is the uh, really thickened bundles of collagen that are cross-linked all through there and create a really firm network, but it's pretty dense collagen. Um, it's a good half of the dermis. The upper half of the dermis is lighter bundles of collagen and uh, a little bit more lacy, loosely intertwined, but clearly microscopically, you can, you can see the difference. Uh, and then above that is the epidermis, and that's comprised of five distinct cell layers, but each layer has hundreds of cells thickness. So the lowest layer is the stratum basale, which is the basal cell layer, and that's pretty much the layer of living tissue, which is important to, to know. Uh, that's the cell that reproduces itself and keeps pushing upwards to form the rest of the, the, rest of the skin. Uh, above that, you have the spiny layer, the granular layer, lucidum is a clear layer, and the stratum corneum, which is the uppermost layer. And that's the key layer that's felt to be uh, our barrier. So anything on the surface of the skin is kept out by, the, by that layer, by the stratum corneum. Once something gets beyond the stratum corneum, it penetrates pretty quickly through the rest of your skin and affects you. So that's our defense against the world. So... Um, so that's our key layer that we're interested in with the whole microneedling thing. Once you get past that, then it, it turns into what's lipophilic, what's hydrophilic, and getting through the rest of the epidermis. Uh, the things that are lipophilic are um, penetrate more easily, more quickly. Hydrophilic or water-loving doesn't penetrate as well. So that's kind of a quickie of the, uh, of the skin. So let's talk about the stratum corneum thickness, because we kind of talk about that a lot. This is just a, a study done many years ago, and I don't think they used a lot of people. It was just kind of a random sampling. But what it showed was the stratum corneum uh, on the cheek was 0.13 millimeters thick. So when you think about it, our shortest needles are 0.25 millimeters. So all of our needles get through the stratum corneum. And that's really fascinating to me because... If that's layer to get past to uh, give you penetration, then even our shortest needles get us through that layer. And then after that, it depends how well the serums penetrate, uh, you know, when they're hydrophilic or lipophilic. So, um, so there's not a huge advantage to longer needles getting you deeper per se, if that's truly the barrier layer of the skin. And that study was 2014. So th that's quite a while back. Uh, next shows the facial skin thickness. And there's three subjects here. Uh, the first two are female, the third one's male, but let's look at the two females. The 51-year-old female in the middle, the uh, thickness of the eyelid is 0.4 millimeters. So keeping that in mind, and since the eyelid's the thinnest skin on the body, if you have someone using a 0.25 millimeter needle and they're getting too close to the eyelid, eyelid skin, then at least we know they can't penetrate through and damage the cornea and affect the eye. Obviously, they shouldn't microneedle that area for any reason, but if they accidentally slip and hit it, then okay, they probably won't do damage. You use the next size up 0.5 millimeter and you're you're into the eye. So, you know, no one should be microneedling near the eye and it doesn't take much to accidentally slip if you go over the cheekbone. Um, and that's the distance we're talking about. So that's incredibly thin. However, the right cheek and the left cheek is a little bit over a millimeter thick. So if you're using a 0.25 or a 0.5, you're not going through the epidermis. If you're using anything longer, like a one millimeter or greater, you're pretty darn close or you're into the dermis at that point. So then you're into the blood vessels and, um, and deeper if you need to be for certain purposes. Uh, right cheek and left cheek are pretty comparable. It's interesting to see a 51-year-old and an 82-year-old because we talk a lot about the skin thinning over the years, but that's you know probably somewhat in the dermis. But in this situation, you know I don't see a difference. These numbers are exactly the same, um, so we're pretty darn close. If anything, it's uh, you know minimal, minimal. So pretty much there may not be that much thinning of facial skin, maybe elsewhere in the body.
Um, so here's uh, the anti-aging skin pyramid. And this came out in 2014, which interestingly enough was the year the ProCell started. So when I'm in my practice, my patients are using all kinds of topical creams. Uh, I was never convinced anything was particularly that effective in rejuvenating their skin as far as uh, what they could put on topically other than hydration, other than using tretinoin cream and, and alpha hydroxy acids, but nothing that was really doing anything outstanding in terms of getting rid of wrinkles and making them look better. And then all of a sudden, around 2014, my patients were coming in telling me that the product that I was re recommending to them, which was made by Neocutis, was actually, they, they felt was working. And I was happily saying, well, okay, that's great. I'm glad to hear it. But as more and more people kept saying that, I realized that, hey, we're really onto something. This is really working. Well, what is in that product? Um, and what's in the product were the stem cell cytokines and growth factors. So that's when this, um, when this paper came out and it really talked about skincare. So this became the basis. I even made up a little desktop uh, sign that I talked about with my patients on a routine basis to go over basic skin care and how they should try to look better. So, uh, and to this day, I still use that. So the, the bottom layer of the, layer of the pyramid is uh, the fundamental protection and repair layer, which is using a sunscreen every day, as we all know that we should use. And it's using antioxidants to reverse the everyday effects of oxidation on the skin which comes from multiple environmental sources typically. And it also, uh, another new entity in there is DNA repair enzymes, which is a topic for another day that we'll talk about. But that's the uh, protection and repair layer. The next level is transformation. And that's moisturization, which makes sense. It's exfoliation with the alpha hydroxy acids. And it's even getting a little bit more aggressive using tretinoin cream to, to help peel the skin and stimulate repair. Um, but all of a sudden, brand new top of the pyramid layer uh, is what this article was all about, is stimulation. Now something that actually stimulates the cells to produce new collagen and thicken the epidermis and make people look more healthy, give them a radiant look because it's stimulating the growth factors coming in there and stimulating the new collagen. So that was something new and that made sense. And that's what my patients were seeing. And that's because of this new uh, new cream that was out there. So, uh, so 2014, uh, big year for lots of things. So that was the year ProCell Therapies was started. And as I was saying, cosmetic patients telling me they like this new serum. Uh, and over the years, there were reports about microneedling treatments actually making their skin look better. And I was a little dubious about microneedling in those days. They talked about collagen induction and stimulation of electro currents in the skin causing collagen to be formed. And it sounded a little bit too much like hype and hocus pocus to me. So I didn't believe it was anything worth considering, um, you know, as an entity unto itself. Um, and then studies had come out over the years also that when you combine something topically with microneedling, it penetrated more, um, more easily, more effectively. So that was nice and maybe was oriented to different kinds of treatments for medical issues, but not anything outstanding for just cosmetic purposes. But those were interesting things to keep in mind. But then all of a sudden we had something from a company that had these new growth factors in it that actually did make people look better. And it seemed to me, you know, well, now we could use that to actually not just treat the disease, but to make people look better. So the light bulb went off. It's like, oh, we have this and we have that. Why not combine the two? And that might really be significant and make microneedling a super thing to use for cosmetic purposes. So looking at um, the company that was making these, uh, this new product that my patients were loving, this is Neocutis that was, that was making it. And their source were fibroblasts. Uh, so fibroblasts were releasing cytokines in cultures. And that's what they were making their creams from. Uh, interestingly, at the time, I found out from Neocutis that they were using fibroblasts from abortion tissue, but they that was a real hush-hush thing. It was an easy type of tissue to obtain, and the fibroblasts were very active because, um, as you can imagine, it's uh, you know, neonatal tissue. But it was it, it was something they didn't want people to know because it would turn off a lot of people to use their cream. So 
not many people knew about that. I don't know if they still do that now. They could still to this day, but they probably have changed since then. Uh, but that's what they used initially. And uh, and it was from fibroblasts that we were seeing these great results. We're going to return to this slide later to talk about the type of cytokines that fibroblasts produce compared to what we're using now. So this is 2017, and a review article came out in the American Society for Derm Surgery, which is a prominent derm journal. And lo and behold, the article said that microneedling creates pores in the stratum corneum and through delayed closure allows for effective intradermal and transdermal drug delivery for a number of drugs. Well, 2017, we had already, our company was already in progress for three years or more by the time this article came out. So it's like, okay, this is old news, but it was wonderful news because uh, all of a sudden it gave credibility. You know, I was trying to sell and I'm not a very good salesperson. And doctors are looking at me like, you know, give me a break, you know, microneedling, no big deal. I don't know if this stuff works. How do I know it's true? So this article all of a sudden gave credibility. All of a sudden, I didn't spend all my time telling doctors that the technique worked because now they all knew it worked. They had this article in 2017 showing it worked. Now I had to tell them why our company was better than the other companies out there that were making microneedling equipment. And we were really the first, and maybe at that point, the only ones that were combining the serum to go with the microneedling. So that was a huge advantage for our company. So let's talk about needles, um, which are best. Uh, all of a sudden, it was a, ra a race to say our needles are longer, longer, deeper is better. Uh, I would stop by it at the different shows and sort of listen at the back of a crowd at a, at a microneedling booth, and they'd be saying, you know, we our needles are longer than everybody else, and it gets it's better, they're deeper. So this study was done in 2008 on Christmas Day was published, so it was a Christmas present. So 2008 is a long time ago. Um, and the study showed they used different lengths of needles to show penetration um, of topically applied products. And the needles that they used, that's 150 microns or 0.15 millimeters, 0.5 millimeters, and 1.5 millimeters. And they measured transepidermal water loss just to show that it was effectively creating channels but they also showed penetration of hydrophilic drugs. And what they showed was that the 0.5 millimeter needle was the most effective for penetration of the skin with drugs to, to enhance absorption. They showed that it was also effective at 0.15 millimeters. And at 1.5 millimeters or longer needles, it was less effective than either of these two shorter lengths. So I think that's a fabulous study because all of a sudden bigger is not better. And people who are using only the 0.25 millimeter needles are getting better results than offices using deeper needles. And you guys all know that 0.25 millimeter needles feel like nothing's happening. It doesn't hurt, it's easy, it's so painless, and it's it's quite effective. So if you're in an office where that like certain states where you're only allowed to do that, wow, let's like not so bad that you can use that and have better results than the longer needles. The 0.5 millimeter needles do work better than the point, the 0.15. So we do recommend the 0.5 millimeter needles as the best length for absorption. So if you're able to use that length, I think that's ideal. Um, but this was just a great study to disprove um, why longer needles you know, are really better, which is not true. Um, why is that the case? You know, one of the theories that I think makes sense is that longer needles cause more tissue trauma, and that happens immediately. And tissue trauma causes swelling, and fluid accumulates in the small channels almost immediately, and that blocks the penetration of what you're putting on topically. So to me, that makes a lot of sense as a good reason. And if I'm explaining that to people, uh, I think it helps them agree and shake their head right away that that makes sense. But this study certainly helps support that. So. Um, that's the story with the needles. Now let's talk about the, what we're putting on topically because this whole system consists of the two parts. So now we're into, well, what are the best things to put on the skin to give us the best results? And lots of studies were shown about growth factors and cytokine showing um, how much better it made the skin look. So we do have tons of studies to support now that that really is the top of the pyramid and is incredibly effective. 
So now the question is, well, what's the difference between growth factors and cytokines? Because we use uh, those terms interchangeably all the time. Well, how are they different? Um, and the answer is they're not. They're interchangeable. They're, they're really the same things. When the term cytokines first came out, it was describing these, uh, these chemicals, these proteins that are found in the bloodstreams and help the cells that are found in the bloodstreams communicate with each other. Um, and then growth factors were more in the tissues and not in the bloodstream. And then over the years, so many different new things were discovered that were in these different families. They grew and grew and grew. And then all of a sudden, they weren't quite just in the bloodstream, just in the tissues. They're found in so many different places that uh, it just, they all merge. So now there isn't really a difference. They're just uh, all part of the same family. Um, so. What is the best source of growth factors now that we know that that's the new cigarette ingredient? Well, up until then, we only had fibroblasts. So fibroblasts uh, take orders, they don't give them. So fibroblasts were what's being used for these growth factors, but are they really the best source? So let's go back to that slide from before, but now the slide's really showing us the difference between fibroblasts and uh, mesenchymal stem cells from bone marrow. And what we're seeing now is that the, in that graph, the fibroblasts really are making very low numbers of, um, of growth factors and much, much higher numbers for uh, cytokines for the mesenchymal stem cells. So looking at that alone, you could say, wow, that's, that means the uh, mesenchymal stem cells are much more effective than fibroblasts. So, and that's true. They're, um, the, the mesenchymal stem cells do secrete all these cytokines that are much more beneficial for normal wound healing, as we'll see, in much higher levels. So how do stem cells differ from other cells? Well, they re can replicate themselves, which is key, and they can differentiate into all kinds of other cells, into fibroblasts, into many different types of cells, whatever is really needed at the site of the injury. So where are the sources right now of these um, cytokines and growth factors that we're seeing? Well, there's mesenchymal stem cells, like with our serums. There's PRP, the so-called vampire facelift. There's um, fibroblasts from fetal and newborn tissue, as we saw with neocutis. There's uh, stem cells from adipose tissue. And there's the parthenogenic embryonic stem cells that are um, typically from human eggs. So um, of those, which will be best then? Well, the stem cells that come from bone marrow are the only ones that control healing in all tissues, including the skin. They originate in the bone marrow, but they quickly get into the bloodstream when they're called and needed somewhere else in the body. So they do help patrol the body. They go to the site of the injury. And once there, they start secreting the cytokines and growth factors necessary for healing. And they're really the only population of cells that um, that will do this function. So all the other sources do not do this. Bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells, commander in chief of our body's repair and regenerative system. Um, it's used all over the body for so many things. Uh, they do suppress inflammation. Well, part of the healing process is inflammation. PRP is from platelets and that causes inflammation, increases blood supply to the area and starts the healing process, which is why it works. But do we really want inflammation in what we're doing? Well, we're creating the channels in the skin. We don't want inflammation. We just want to stimulate the collagen and the healing process. So why put something on the skin that's going to cause inflammation to help it heal when we don't necessarily want to heal? We want the, we want the, um, the stimulation. So more ideal is having um, a product from stem cells that just helps stimulate. So that's kind of key in this whole thinking as to why this is so much better than a vampire faceless, for example, and using all the other forms of cytokines and growth factors. Um, and then just a little bit more about the stem cells from bone marrow. They, they do remodeling and regeneration of damaged areas. These are all just studies done back in 2007, 2008, just showing what we know that the bone marrow mesenchymal stem cells are really um, integral in so many different areas of the body for repairing. Uh, well, Interesting and dramatic, newborn high levels of mesenchymal stem cells, teenagers, that's dropped a lot. Age 30 dropped a lot more. Um, after that, they're like hardly there. So 
Well, what's going on? Well, you know, it's a nice thought for older people to be putting this on the sim because now they can have something that they're sorely lacking. Um, I often wonder, you know, after the age of 30, I guess uh, this is all going back to our ancestry, but I guess we're made to reproduce, get the kids out the door. And after 30, things are superfluous. So it's kind of weird how that drops off so dramatically. But Aside from that, now at least we can uh, have a topical source to supplement that. But clearly, there's um, you know there's not a lot of those stem cells, so uh, the body can be very resp responsive to what we're putting on. So, what are cytokines and growth factors? They're simply signaling molecules. It's, this is paracrine communication. So, we know endocrine. That's something secreted by a gland in one area of the body, and its effect is somewhere further away uh, elsewhere in the body. Paracrine means is close by. So one cell secretes this messenger and then it's transmitted to another cell nearby, right in the area. Um, so that's the difference. These are all paracrine communication. Um, and they stimulate the cell, they attach to the cell membrane, and then they stimulate the cell to start um, doing whatever it needs to do, whatever the messenger is telling us to. There are so many cytokines and growth factors now, and there's no ones or small numbers that cause what we're looking at. You know, there's just hundreds of them that are secreted and it's a combination of all of those that give us the results that we're seeing. Inflammation is a big topic for quite a while now. Um, so there's chronic inflammation and there's acute inflammation, but it's a chronic inflammation that we're seeing as causes of so many diseases, obesity, diabetes, uh, you know, the blood vessels getting clogged. Um, uh, so that's, uh, that's a big deal these days, and you'll hear about it all the time. Sun exposure, environmental toxins, metabolic by byproducts cause chronic inflammation in the skin. So inflammation is a bad thing. So if you have growth factors and cytokines that are causing inflammation, that's not a good thing. If it's anti-inflammatory, then that is a good thing. So aging skin is caused by micro injuries to the skin over a lifetime, and that's all causing inflammation. So anything we can do to reverse that and the anti-inflammatory is, is the key here. So if you're putting on a cream that's causing inflammation, that's not helping, but it's the anti-inflammatory effects that are super important and why our creams are better than everything else out there. And here's a little uh, chart showing the different types, the more common types of cytokines and growth factors. And there's just thousands of these, but just to categorize them, you have the inflammatory cytokines that are acute, the inflammatory cytokines that are chronic. You have the anti-inflammatory cytokines and some of the, um, the in-between ones that don't fall in either category. But they just that just gives you an idea of some of the basic ones. Under the anti-inflammatories, you'll see TGF-beta-3, which is a key one, and that's one that uh, gets supplemented in our serums because it's so important. Mesenchymal stem cells, that's this is uh, their cytokine profile. And what it shows is that it's a greater number of preponderance of anti-inflammatory cytokine. And the inflammatory side is much lighter. So that's key. We, we want the anti-inflammatory effect, which is why our serums work so well. PRP is highly inflammatory. Um, and that's how it works. So it makes sense. PRP is part of wound repair. When you get injured, you need inflammation to heal. And it makes sense. But that's why it's not as good as what we have. And this is a good example of why that why we say what we say. Adipose tissue. A uh, fair number of companies make um, their serums from zincable stem cells from adipose tissue. And fat, we know, is pro-inflammatory. Uh, that's just simply the effect of fat and has an effect on the blood vessels all over the body because of that. And that's the reason why these uh, mesangible stem cells in the adipose tissue have a much higher profile of inflammatory cytokines. Quoting Albert Einstein, if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. So uh, got to keep it simple. Uh, aging skins from accumulated damage over time. Chronic inflammation is a huge factor. Acute inflammation causes pigment and scar issues. Stem cell cytokines and growth factors stimulate and optimize the skin as we see with the pyramid. Topical cytokines and growth factors can enhance healing and improve the appearance, and especially when they're not the inflammatory type. Uh, and then the mesenchymal stem cells control healing because of the pro-healing anti-inflammatory cytokines. 
they decrease the number through the decades. So it's nice when we can supplement that now and putting on topically turns the skin back to a younger time. And this is a thank you to everyone. Um, it's been quite the ride and the company is doing just incredibly well, exponential growth. And it's to all you out there who do this. So my thanks to everyone for what you do. And uh, I wish all of us continued success for the future. And now that I'm semi-retired, I'm available for uh, questions and help along the way, if, if, uh, not just today, but any day if someone has anything I can help with, I'm happy to help. Thank you very much. We've got time for questions. So uh, anybody that wants to ask, um, definitely feel free to start. The um, You can either put them in the chat um, or you can just ask directly. So I'll open that up now. Dr. Schwartz, thanks for your time today. It's uh, awesome to, to have you. But I was just curious, um, when we're talking to clients, you know, in offices and demos or whatever, say, you know, there may be a more clinical setting. Um, a lot of these people are, you know, getting more into, you know, exosomes. What would you say is the best kind of, you know, point to make against why we would use our serums and how to sell somebody on this versus them maybe already using exosomes? Mm -hmm. Sure. No, oh, thanks, Nate. Uh, we've been kicking around exosomes for a long time. So when I first heard about exosomes, which was quite a few years ago, I'd say at least five, if not more years ago, we looked at it, I looked at it closely. And exosomes is merely, uh, you know, it's what's, it, it's the vehicle. It's this little balloon inside the cell that contains things. And for people, and I see some people saying, what are exosomes? Um, you know, we used to think it was waste products that the cell was getting rid of. They package it up in a little balloon and kick it out of the cell and it would get rid of stuff. So initially they thought it was just trash coming out of the cell. Then they discovered, no, there's all kinds of stuff in there. Uh, and all of these, you know, all, all these things that we've been talking about, all the growth factors and cytokines can be contained within the exosomes as well. And that was a way that cells were communicating with one another just packaging, packaging them up inside these membranes. So with that in mind, uh, okay, well, there are growth factors and cytokines. Well, that's what we're talking about. So when our serum came out, it was encased in liposomes, which makes it more, um, you know, not hydrophilic, but more, you know, dissolving in fat tissue and oil tissue. So it penetrates better. So liposomes became a big deal when you encase something to get it to penetrate better through the skin, through the stratum cornea which makes sense. So putting exosomes on the skin, in a sense, does the same thing. It helps it penetrate. But why is it better? Well, it's the same thing inside. It's just a way of getting these messengers into the skin through the cells. So is it better than liposomes surrounding the messengers? I haven't seen studies to say it's better yet to make me say, gee, we should switch our, our packaging to get it through. I've seen great results from these exosomes, but they're comparable to the great results that we're seeing. Um, not better, not worse. It sounds like a new exciting thing and everybody's making a big deal of it. Um, but again, thinking in terms, it's not a magic ingredient, it's what's inside of them. So that's just a way to get these messengers through there. So that's the key. There are some problems with exosomes where they have to be frozen for transport and refrigerated. They have a very low, uh, a short shelf life, so it makes them harder to use. They can be very expensive uh, to get out there. So there are extremely low numbers now that initially to keep the prices down. So, um, you know, we keep talking to different companies about it, but there's some real problems. The practicality is of getting into offices in a frozen state and get used right away within a number of days and everything else. And then cost is a little bit crazy too. So we'll hear more and more in the future as they get better and better, better shelf life, better transport. Um, maybe if somebody convinces me they work better than what we have, then we would say, gee, we really should change over and consider that. Um, so we're, we've been following it closely, uh, but I haven't seen anything convincing me that there's a reason why we have to have to switch to anything just yet, if that makes sense. But there's no magic thing about exosomes. It's only what's in them. So as long as what's in them is what is in our stuff, then uh, that's what counts to make it work. Awesome. That's that's very really helpful. Thanks, Dr. Shorts. Okay. She's asking if it's a, con a contraindication to this treatment. Actinic Yes. Uh, 
Uh, no, well, no, actinic keratoses are just simply areas of sun damage. You know, they're considered precancerous. Um, they don't, that only consider the thousands of keratoses people get on their face. Uh, very few of them actually turn into skin cancer. So they're just chronic conditions of sun damage. And that's what we're treating. You know, we're reversing the effects of chronic damage to the skin. So in a way, you might say this could actually help to uh, heal some of those keratoses. Keratoses can heal themselves. They can come and go over time. And some nasty ones continue on the skin cancers. And a lot of them just hang out and stay there. So um, I think our treatments can actually help that. They certainly won't, won't hurt things. So there's no reason not to use it. Thank you again for your presentation. It was very beneficial. You mentioned exosomes, but what about um, some type of plant-based um, serum? How I know they don't compare personally, but I do have a lot of clients ask about something like that and how those vitamins and nutrients from that could be beneficial to the skin as well. What do you think about that? Uh, well, there's a, there are a lot of plant-based stem cell serums that have been out for many, many years. And there's been a ton of studies done on that. And they're nice because they're cheap. So they can make them fairly inexpensively. Um, but all the studies show that they're plant-based and they're really not related to what you know human um, cytokines are like. So they don't have nearly the same activity, not nearly the same efficacy as human-derived products. So um, in that sense, they're a step down, um, but they add a lot of nice things to them uh, and they can be a lot less expensive as well. They just don't work as well. So they can smell nice. They can put in other things in there that help make the skin look nice. But as far as that top of the pyramid, the real stimulation effect, and that's really what you want. And that's, that's optimized by human-based products over plant-based products. So does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. We had once chatted about transexamic acid in a brightening solution. I wonder if there's any thoughts about that. Thank you. Uh, the transamic acid, um, yeah, there's, every month I see another study showing some new, uh, new study showing that uh, using a different type of medication for treatment of a medical problem and how it's more effective using microneedling, which is pretty amazing to see these days. Um, but treating hyperpigmentation is, uh, is certainly huge around the world. And we've been looking at, at something for that for a couple of years now, trying to develop what we thought would be the best thing out there. Uh, transemic acids being used for a bunch of different things now with microneedling. And there's many studies showing how safe it is. So that's a great product to use for this. So, so yeah, I absolutely think it's, um, it's what we need for the future. Um, what's been taking a while is that uh, I have, I've made up a couple of formulas that we've tested, but every time we kind of get somewhere with it, something new comes up that's even better. So we just got something new that came out a couple of years ago that's better than everything for treating hyperpigmentation. And it has an anti-cancer effect as well as reducing pigmentation. So it's an amazing treatment. So that's been the latest. And and it's time for us to come out with something. So we finally, we're now testing that those serums. And it does have transemic acid in it, and it has this new ingredient and a couple others. It's got like five different actives in it, each of which is really effective. And I think the combination is going to be by far the best in the world for this purpose. Um, but yeah, people right now are using trans transemic acid and getting great results um, from that alone treating hyperpigmentation. So I think it is uh, something that's important for us to be using in the future. If the, you know, if there was prior uh, uh, facial cancers uh, and how the cytokines and growth factors played a part in that or helped heal or uh, could be an issue for this, this treatment. Mm -hmm. Right. So, yeah, not a problem. People with uh, a lot of actinic keratosis have pretty sensitive skin sometimes. So they have a lot of transepidermal water loss, their skin is getting dry, it's sensitive to anything they put on, can sting their skin. Even going out on not so sunny days, it stings the skin, so they're careful with the sun. So things they put on can actually sting and a, a microneedling treatment might even be uncomfortable for them. So even better to use um, shorter needles. And because their skin's so, um, you know, so open and penetrate, things penetrate so easily, 
you can supplement that with really short needles to make it more comfortable for them, knowing that the serum you're putting on the skin is going to penetrate really well through all the openings they have naturally from all the sun damage. So those are people to go, you know, easier with the treatment, not feel like, well, deeper needles will, will work better for them. Smaller needles are even better. There's a question here about, will Procell ever be approved for pregnant women? Um, no, <laughs> nothing gets approved to, to be used in pregnant women unless it does extensive testing which becomes expensive testing. And to do that, you know, most drug companies don't get involved in that. It's just crazy, the, the cost for those studies. And, and then how do you prove something like that and even do tests on women who volunteer? It's just a nightmare. So it's easier to say, it seems safe, there's no logical reason, but just to be safe, you shouldn't, um, you shouldn't do it during pregnancy. Uh, Botox is a good example of that. You know, it's a locally injected drug. Uh, it binds immediately to the nerve endings superficially in the skin. It doesn't travel anywhere through the bloodstream or it would be really, you know, a whole different story. And I told every patient, you can't be pregnant or I won't inject you, even though I know that there's no way that Botox can affect, you know, the fetus. It's perfectly safe. Um, nobody's ever going to do a study showing that it's safe during pregnancy. They rather just tell people we don't know and you shouldn't get the treatment. So that's true for many things and will certainly be true for us. Chanel actually had asked a question earlier about if we knew how long it takes for the body to recognize new collagen production. Um, um, yeah, that's kind of a, a vague answer. How long does it take the body to recognize new collagen production? You know, when you think of the whole cytokine system, there's so much communication happening instantly. So it, makes you believe that that you know there's talk between the cells that's just immediate so as soon as the collagen is being formed there's cells saying okay we're working you know we got the message we're taking care of things and then what stops it uh, the cells are saying hey we're, we're good we're there so the message system is sort of reversing and sending new messages saying okay stop stop the stimulation we don't need any more collagen there are people that overproduce collagen and make keloids and, you know, all the, the bad things because they don't have that feedback. But uh, it seems to me that there's just immediate back and forth talk between cells uh, as to what's going on. And it amazes me, you know, the communications, when you see the intracellular communication charts and all the lines and crisscrosses, it's just uh, mind boggling how effective our body uh, is communicating with each other and, how complicated things are. I don't know how our system evolved into this, but um, we're incredibly complex beings. And even the time I'm in dermatology and we learn more and more about how just the skin works from when I first started, is just phenomenal. So uh, I think there's talk going back and forth and nothing's happening between the cells that they're not aware of minute by minute as to what's going on. Um, Dr. Andrea uh, from Ireland has a question about the hair growth. Can you explain a bit how the serums work on hair loss and if alopecia areata can be treated with the serums? Well, yeah, alopecia areata is is a difficult one to treat because that's really, uh, an, you know, it's in that category of autoimmune. So it's not just simply, you know, like the normal androgenetic alopecia that's caused by the hormones and growing and just aging. And then just getting in there and trying to stimulate the hair to regrow. Uh, alopecia areata is, is a tricky um, because you're not treating the cause. You're just treating the symptom. So as long as this autoimmune phenomenon is taking place, the hair follicle is not being allowed to grow. And it's pretty hard to overcome that. So I've not seen you know particularly good studies showing that um, any kind of treatment like this topically with growth factors really gives a significant result. Um, if someone does get great results with it, then it's either coincidental with great timing, or we don't know why. It just somehow stopped the immune process from doing what it's doing and then allowed the hair to grow back again. So, so that's a tough one for alopecia areata. There's so many treatments that have been tried for that, and it's a really debilitating disease, and uh, it, there's just not really great treatment. Um, our treatment, uh, just for regular, like al androgenetic alopecia, 
is effective. And, and it's interesting um, looking at the short versus long needles, because when we first started doing it, we thought we needed the long needles to really penetrate deep into the skin to be able to get down to these deep um, follicles that are way, way under the skin. And even the long needles barely reach that. But um, a lot of studies now have shown that just once you get it in the surface, it'll migrate down to the hair follicle and be effective. So again, you don't need long needles and, and scalps are really uncomfortable. So um, you can use shorter needles, ideally even the 0.5 millimeter needles and get the growth factors deeply enough into the skin that they will get down to the hair follicle. And then the hair follicle, the, um, the growth factors in our hair serums are, are the ones that are optimized growth. So they're the ones that have been shown to help stimulate the hair follicles to grow new hair. So they are directed more for that purpose. Hey, Dr. Schwartz, this is Vincent again. I just want you to know that I think that uh, the hair treatment is something that's maybe misunderstood and not focused on a lot, but I just had a client who sent me photos and Daniel, I did forward these to you. She had a hair transplant in the back of her head because she was losing so much hair and it was a huge scar that was left. And one of our customers uh, did the channeling on the scar and has regrown hair in the transplant area. Pretty amazing photos. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I was at the yeah. uh, our show in uh, in Las Vegas, and I met a bunch of our reps who I'd never met before, and they were coming up to me and showing me on their cell phones before and afters that blew me away. I had no idea that this is so effective for hair growth, for for wrinkles, or it's uh, for scarring. It's just amazing to me how effective it has been for so many people. So there was a lot of those great pictures out there. I love to see those results. And a lot of plastic surgeons out there really could use, you know, our products because when they're doing these hair transplants, they'll supplement it with microneedling to help, you know, fill in around the scar tissue, around the hair plugs they're doing, whatever transplant method they use, this can really supplement that as well as create more hair within the uh, transplant itself. So um, there's a lot of potential out there for that. Hey, Dr. Schwartz, this is Jimmy here. Um, Regarding the hair, do you think it's okay or safe to work on transplanted hair or areas where the hair has been transplanted to? Uh, yeah, oh, perfectly safe. Uh, again, I wouldn't use the longer needles. I would use the short needles, so still work fine. And I think uh, there are a lot of plastic surgeons that are routinely doing that, that are you know doing the transplant and then bringing their patients back for microneedling treatments with uh, growth factors specifically for hair and getting good results. So I, I totally agree. It is a good thing to do. Do you think that it's possible that hair transplants could potentially be the reason why somebody wouldn't benefit from our treatment? Because I did five treatments on this guy who had two hair transplants, and we didn't see like any growth at all. Do you think it could have been that or maybe there's some other underlying cause or something? Yeah, I don't think it would, I can't think of any reason why the transplant itself would inhibit the serum or the treatment from working. So um, maybe it's just getting used to its new environment, new location, and it's being overwhelmed with all kinds of messages and things. But once enough time goes by, time being like a good six months or more, then they could try it again. And if it's not working, it's just not working. But I, I, there's no logical reason that I could think of that the transplant should affect it otherwise. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz, right. for your time. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Schwartz.